I'll be moderating this discussion today where we will hear from three distinguished individuals and experts who will be sharing their perspectives of the current microfinancial landscape in Malaysia. We will also dive deeper into the challenges and opportunities of microcredentials in tertiary education and professional development, as well as the potential impact that digital badging and credentialing will have on the nation's lifelong learning agenda. Without further ado, let me introduce our panels. We have Professor Dr. Vinesh from Asia Pacific University. Dr. Vinesh is currently the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Research and Innovation, as well as the Chief Innovation Officer for APIT Education Group. He's been actively involved in various expert task forces and blueprint committees, and, and also has been instrumental in structuring APU's first 77 micro credential offerings in the year 2020. Um, we also have Dr. Eddie from the Finance Accreditation Agency. Um, Dr. Eddie is the Chief Technical Officer for Quality Assurance, a senior assessor and an expert trainer for the Malaysia Qualifications Agency. He has also chaired the panel for the development and revision of multiple programs as well as MQA's guideline to good practices. Um, also, we are. We will also have um, a, another distinguished speak, um, expert as well that will be joining us soon. Uh, who is Mr. Elia Raj Ratnam or Raj? He is currently the head of program review and accreditation department at HRD Corp. Welcome to the panels, and also thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, before we start, let me quickly share Open Learning's background and involvement with regard to micro-credentials for the past couple of years. Early last year in Sydney, Australia, the team started thinking about a common framework with a general approach and standard to support not only Australian education providers, but also the Malaysian providers as well as other education providers around the world. Upon engagement and consultation with about 350 individuals from universities, vocational education providers, TVET industries, associations, government agencies, as well as qualification agencies, a draft of the framework was produced, and we call it the Open Crest Framework. The framework has been designed to encourage partnerships between different cost providers to support recognition of prior learning and set the benchmark for the quality of micro credentials. And a couple of months later, when the guidelines to good practices, micro-credentials that was produced by MQA, we looked through the document and engaged with very relevant stakeholders in Malaysia and with their feedback produced a version of the Open Crest Framework for the Malaysian education providers. We launched the Open Crest Framework for Malaysia in November last year. And since then, we've engaged with various higher learning institutions and training providers in Malaysia to support them in their microfinancial journey. As of now, we've got more than 50 open grads courses available to the public and more in the development pipeline. So with that, I'd like to pass the floor now to the panels and let them share their background and experience in relation to microcredentials. So um, maybe we can start with Dr. Eddie. Dr. Eddie was one of the individuals I engaged with when I was doing my own mini research on the microcredential ecosystem in Malaysia. So Dr. Eddie, I'm aware that FAA also ran a few webinars and engagement activities related to microcredentials. And maybe you can share with us um, what was the motivation for this in which, uh, for these initi initiatives and um, how do you perceive FAA's role in the microcredential ecosystem in Malaysia? Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Mashita. Am I audible? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, a very good morning, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it definitely gives me great pleasure to be with you, Mashita, uh, Prof Vinesh. I'm later on our friend, Mr. Eli Raj, uh, who will join us uh, very soon, I hope, and all our friends uh, who have taken part in this discussion this morning. Um, may I just begin with a brief background of my agency, as, we, as this will help me to address uh, the part on our micro-credentials initiatives. 
Um, FAA is a quality assurance and accreditation agency established by Bank Negara Malaysia and Securities Commission Malaysia. And generally, we play three roles. One, we accredit professional and academic programs, as well as individuals in the financial services industry. Two, we are involved in the competency development for the different sectors for the financial services industry. And three, we provide train the trainer program, which is known as certified training professional. So now comes the part on our micro credentials initiatives, uh, Mashita. Mm -hmm. um, as you have rightfully mentioned, as you have rightfully mentioned, we have run a number of webinars, um, especially uh, targeting at the uh, professional training providers, uh, in allowing them to understand more about micro credentials, its features, how it works, and so on. Um, of course, I will dwell into um, this a bit more later. Uh, but let me also share that um, how honoured we are uh, to be given the opportunity to work with MQA, uh, especially on the development of the GGP, as you have uh, rightfully mentioned just now, for micro-credentials, which uh, was published in 2020. And currently, uh, we are also working with MQA, um, along with our friend Mr. Raj from HRD Corp, um, um, with also um, the participation of uh, MOHE, uh, CIDB, uh, JPK, MDEC, Pekeso, and some universities to develop a guideline for standalone micro credentials. And this guideline is supposed to serve different industry sectors in Malaysia. And of course, for us in FAA, standalone micro credentials refer to the CPD uh, programs and short courses, including in house programs offered by and for the financial services industry. And because of this development, um, I'm sure we see the connection why. Um, is it a need for FAA to reach out to more people in the industry uh, as much as possible to promote to them the idea of micro-credentials, not just from the demand side, but also on the supply side as well, um, mm -hmm. so that the industry is um, aware of the development of what's going on and the exciting prospects that um, micro-credentials will be bringing to them. And, and of course, linked to this will be the um, recognition that we have for the award of credits. Now that as we know that um, micro-credentials lead to the award of credits, mm -hmm. and therefore this necessitates collaboration with universities because our universities um, have the authority to award credits. And therefore, one of the very important initiatives that FAA is currently uh, working on is to establish a guideline. And this guideline will benefit uh, the professional uh, training providers, the financial services industry, and even universities whose programs we have accredited right, in terms of how do we bridge the uh, collaboration between academia and industry. And this is also uh, linked to our another initiative, which is to continue talking to the industry, to the universities about um, a possible partnership between both parties and to us uh, we will continue to promote this as an all means solution in terms of how uh, micro credentials uh, through such partnerships can enhance the university's competency based curriculum. And of course, the possibility of um, the industry to come in to combine uh, what we call uh, academic qualifications with certification. And of course, all this will greatly benefit um, the graduates because this would mean a better prospect of employment and employability, uh, definitely, of course, in the financial services industry. And um, one of our um, latest initiative too, and I'm sure Mashita is in the know, um, is that we are working with open learning for our certified training professional program um, so that our certified trainers will be awarded digital badges moving forward. Um, I, I wouldn't dwell into a digital badges at this point of time, um, I, but I will do so later as I share some interesting perspectives from the industry. So I will stop here for the time being, Mashita. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Eddie. And I look forward to uh, go through the course on the uh, uh, certified training providers course on the platform once uh, you have launched it. And also um, on the guideline for training providers to bridge the gap between academia and industry, I think that would be really uh, a very insightful guideline for us as well. Thank you so much for sharing. And also, um, okay, so maybe uh, Dr. Vinesh, let's uh, move on to um, 
to you on um, I know that APU is considered as one of the early adopters of micro-credentials with more than 100 micro-credentials under your belt. And also, um, so I think this morning, would you be able to share with us your journey, including the challenges that you face and what you think the future of tertiary education will look like with dig digital badging and credentialing coming into place? Uh, thanks, Mashita, uh, and thank you to Open Learning for organizing this wonderful session today. Uh, and uh, a very good morning to the virtual audience uh, and also my fellow panelists, uh, Dr. Eddie and uh, Mr. Yale Raj. Right, I think I was muted. <laughs> right, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mashita, uh, and thank you, Open Learning, for this opportunity. I also like to, uh, I'm humbled to be part of this panel together with Dr. Eddie and Mr. Yale Raj. And a very good morning to the entire virtual audience. Uh, let me just share with you a, a quick insight to how uh, Asia Pacific University of Technology Innovation, APU, how we ventured into uh, micro credentials. Mm -hmm. So, back in 2019, uh, without knowing COVID was going to happen, obviously, uh, we, we had a, a scheme in place that we wanted to uh, profile our students. So, the focus was always on our students, uh, and you know, we have close to 13,000 of them. And we want them to be more marketable, more employable, more employable, and uh, uh, raise their, their market demand. So we knew that there were students who were in a certain discipline who could not uh, get access to uh, certain uh, type of modules or upscaling areas. And that's when we went into the, the whole uh, uh, thinking process and a strategic movement uh, to look into micro-credentials. And we started a uh, formation of micro-credentials uh, simply by uh, identification of which micro-credential uh, would suit them best. Uh, then we also wanted to study the delivery uh, mode and model and uh, also to see whether there were any standards to abide or comply with. Uh, for a tertiary institution like us, uh, MQA would be the first uh, step for any uh, standards to comply with. Uh, because this entire deploy, uh, deployment of micro-credentials had to go through a strategic uh, planning process. So we went through the planning process in 2019. Uh, in 2020, when COVID happened, uh, it was uh, a no-brainer to start offering micro-credentials because uh, everything was virtual and we wanted to uh, roll them out. Uh, so what we did was we went into design mode. So we started the formation of this group called the Subject Matter Expert Group. They involved about 38 academicians uh, covering all the areas uh, that we thought would be uh, a good design in terms of micro-credentials. Mm -hmm. So they covered areas like computing, technology, engineering, and social sciences as well. And with that, we came up with the first batch of micro-credentials. Uh, uh, there were 77 of them at that time, yeah, uh, early part of 2020, uh, within the second quarter itself. And, uh, and then, after we had identified the 77, uh, we went into design mode in terms of the scheme of work, uh, the content, the duration, and we worked within the internal departments uh, at APU, uh, mainly our corporate training division who, who could advise us on how to um, deliver these kind of uh, micro-credentials in a training mode. And then we also uh, design, uh, worked with our administrative uh, department in, to ensure that there was a seamless flow of registration to digital badging offering to completion, yeah. Uh, and that was all uh, completed. And towards the end of uh, quarter three, at, and towards the early part of quarter four, 2020, we started offering these 77. And we, uh, it compromised into four categories. So we had them in, in, a, in, a, in a tight mode. So there was type A, B, C, D, uh, and it was strategically uh, designed and we offered all 77. Uh, and to date, uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, we have had uh, 22 out of the 77, plus more that came uh, later in, in, in 2021 as well. Uh, so that's why the numbers went up to above 100. Yeah? Uh, there has been 17 that has been taken up, uh, uh, which is very healthy uh, because these are the popular uh, micro-credentials. And we have actually, uh, I, I would like to say that the, use the term graduated yeah, uh, with the digital badges, uh, 785 students. Uh, and, and that is quite a lot uh, in terms of uh, just, I would say about uh, 
between 16 months of, of rollout. So uh, we are very happy that uh, we managed to identify, uh, strategize the delivery model, uh, and also put the experts together to design the micro-credentials and, uh, and work with the internal departments to sort of push those micro-credentials out. And uh, at one time, uh, uh, obviously now a lot of our, our peers have uh, caught up uh, with APU in terms of uh, micro-credential offerings because it has become uh, sort of a norm. But at one time, we were the highest in Malaysia. Uh, definitely uh, until uh, the first quarter or second quarter of 2021, we were the highest in Malaysia in terms of micro-credential offerings. Uh, designed and ready to offer. And to date, I think 785 students is, uh, is a number that is quite challenging and competitive. Yeah, so we, we're, we're there in terms of micro-credentials. We work very well uh, with our internal uh, departments and we're looking forward to working with uh, external parties as well uh, to take it one step further. Because uh, in terms of profiling our students, uh, they cannot learn everything within a, a certain curriculum. Uh, so you take a certain discipline, a certain program, uh, there is a, a program which follows a certain standard, a certain yeah. number of modules that they have to take. So the micro-credentials are something outside the curriculum, which they can take to, uh, to profile themselves, make them more marketable. And that is what micro-credentials is uh, for our students. Yeah, so thank you, Mashita. Thank you so much, you. Vinesh, for sharing. And I think it's uh, really an achievement for um, within a couple of months, uh, there's around 785 students have graduated from the micro credential. And um, uh, I, I think it will be really um, insightful for us to learn more from your team as well uh, in terms of the strategy that you have implemented and also um, the, the feel or the topics of the courses that you have decided to develop into micro credentials as you mentioned it's uh, outside of the curriculum so it will be really useful for us to learn more um, with you in the future on um, how, how how does if you decide on the um, topics of the curriculum um, yeah so thank you so much for for sharing uh dr Vinesh. and uh raj welcome um uh, and uh how are you okay all good Finally, finally, I managed to enter this. <laughs> Thanks, my sister. No worries, no worries. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your time, also, and also for for joining us. And um, so let's hear it from the perspective of HRD Corp, right? Um, Raj, can you share your insights on the initiatives for lifelong learners, specifically for the employees, and where micro credentials fit into the nation's talent development agenda? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Mashita. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Eddie Chong from uh, FAA and also uh, Dr. Vignesh Tiruchalwan from uh, Asia Pacific University to be uh, my, my co-panels uh, on this session, a very uh, interesting session because we are looking at a future methodology of how education and uh, human capital development is going to be structured again. And uh, as far as uh, Human Resource uh, Development Corporation is concerned, uh, just to give you a little bit brief about HRDC, uh, we are actually uh, an agency under the purview of uh, Human Resource uh, Ministry of Malaysia that manage training funds for employers across all the sectors in Malaysia. Mainly, uh, we are targeting the economic sectors such as manufacturing, services, uh, mining and pouring, as well as most of the other sectors, which just newly joined HRD Corp. And uh, since our establishment, uh, HRDC has uh, implemented various programs uh, initiated to accommodate uh, training needs of our stakeholders. Uh, we have about more than uh, 50,000 registered uh, employers uh, comprising of almost 3.5 million employees. And uh, cumulatively, based on our past Five years trend uh, prior to COVID. Prior to COVID, uh, based on our five years trend, on a yearly basis, the number has been increasing six percent. All right, and uh, accumulatively, in year two thousand nineteen, we have actually exceeded the number of training places, the certification produced by HRD Corp to cater almost one million employees. So. When it comes to training and development, how we want to ensure that the human capital development is managed accordingly to the national growth, 
as well as other uh, regional partners, as well as global partners growth is for us to look into how we can actually uh, bring up the current levels of our employers. How do we upskill and reskill the employees and so on? So this is where we have actually looked into how we could further strengthen our employees' uh, skills, competency, and knowledge in terms of future required skills. And we also looked into uh, the human capital development uh, perspective where it is the critical enabler for actually drive and sustaining Malaysia's economic growth. And the availability of a skilled workforce is necessary to support the transition of all economic sector towards knowledge intensified activities and labor productivity gains. But uh, as far as Malaysians are concerned, I will put it in the perspective that we can actually consider micro-credential as a very magical jigsaw puzzle, right? Everybody, uh, when it comes to the terminology of micro-credential, a lot of stakeholders, a lot of uh, new newcomers will be wondering what is micro-credential? Because all, all that we are trained, all that we have been experiencing is full-time modules, full-time curriculum, four years, two years for masters, three years for PhDs, diplomas, and so on. But now something new is happening called micro-credential and how does it work? This is where uh, we actually, uh, the availability of a skilled workforce is very necessary to support the transition. And how do we create this? And micro-credential is one of the enablers. As I mentioned, imagine a magical jigsaw puzzle consists of knowledge, skills, uh, attitude, elements in it with a very uh, holistic and stringent uh, assessment criteria built upon. And the learners will be able to accumulate this jigsaw puzzle regardless of where does it links to, but they will be able to put in together to create a recognition. That's what we intend to do. And uh, I think uh, we have engaged uh, Mashita and the team. A lot of stakeholders have been involving in this. We have, HRD Corp particularly have come up with a micro-credential framework to cater the needs of our stakeholders because one of the limitation earlier when we introduced micro-credential in Malaysia is the take up, the subscription. And uh, now uh, we, are, we are actually providing this opportunity to working adults, particularly uh, those who are registered under HRD Corp because they have their levy contributed to us so they can utilize back their levy to actually ensure that their employees are being trained, being upskilled and given due recognition through recognition of professional certification. So this is just an introduction to what we are currently doing. And uh, I think we will discuss more as Mashita gives us the cue. Thanks, Mashita. Thank you so much, Raj. Thank you so much for sharing. And um, the magical jigsaw puzzle that you mentioned is... Uh, uh, it's a nice term. Uh, it sounds very um, inspiring, right, for us to work towards this magical jigsaw puzzle together. So uh, I would like to dive deeper into one of the points that you have mentioned in terms of awareness, right? So, um, uh, so in your opinion, based on um, HRD Corp's um, experience um, and throughout what you have uh, been working so far uh, in terms of micro credential. Um, do you think right now, uh, or what is the, if you can um, rate, what is the current public, or uh, when, when I say public, um, specifically the employers or potential learners, how are the rate of awareness in terms of the existence of micro credential? Thanks, Mashita. So, uh, in terms of awareness, uh, to, to, to be very I think. All right. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, I can. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, as far as awareness is concerned, when we first took up this uh, project on micro credential, to be very frank, mm -hmm. uh, the entire organization was wondering what is micro credential? What we are going to do with micro credential and how it will benefit the working adults? Because micro credential is always associated with academics terminology, not uh, in terms of adult training and development and so on. 
However, what we did initially, we did benchmarking with a lot of uh, developed and uh, most of the countries who have already ventured into this particular micro credential landscape earlier. And we actually studied how do we effectively implement a structure to accommodate both the, the industry as well as the academic part of it. And uh, if we are looking at the awareness level, I would say uh, we can go few levels, Makita, uh, mm -hmm. as, as uh, we can, uh, I will look into a perspective of a business modeling, how we could actually create a model to get this micro-credential reach out to our respective stakeholders. So uh, I, I always compare this uh, awareness of micro-credential with IDA model, awareness, interest, desire, and action. So where we are now is, we are still at the awareness level where we are still telling people what it is mm -hmm. to create the attention. Because uh, one, we are talking about the stakeholders who will be benefiting from micro-credential. The other stakeholders are those who will create micro-credential. Higher learning institution, the accreditation centers under DSD, the training providers under HRD Corp. So these are the first layer of group that needs to know what is it. They need to understand through this particular development of micro-credential program, who are the stakeholders that will benefit. And then we will be able to move to the next layer of the pyramid where we will create interest among all the stakeholders, which are the learners and desire for the learners to take up micro-credential program and towards the end, the action upon completing micro-credential program. So as of now, we are still in the very base level, we are creating awareness and, and we have actually conducted a pilot study end of last year and, and the awareness is there among the stakeholders who are the providers. Now the awareness should go on to the learners for them to take up more micro-credential program for us to have a very clear pathway picture on micro-credential and how it will help the learners. Thanks, Manchita. Thank you so much for sharing and uh, also for sharing uh, the, the model that um, you're basing on in terms of the awareness. Um, uh, I, I, maybe the same question I'd like to uh, gauge your opinion, Dr. Vinesh, um, since um, you also mentioned that there are around 700 I'm sorry, Mashita, you are muted. Can you unmute yourself? Sorry, sorry, I wasn't aware that I muted. Um, uh, I, no, what, uh, what I was saying was, um, I would like to gauge uh, Dr. Vinesh's opinion on the awareness of micro-credentials as well. Um, looking at uh, the micro-credentials uh, that was offered by APU, has, uh, you currently have 700 plus students that have graduated. So um, maybe you can share with us what are the, the, the profiles of these students, uh, if they are working adults or um, undergraduate students, SPM leavers, so that we can also uh, sort of gauge the kind of um, audience that are interested in the micro-credential offering. Yeah, so uh, what, what we did was we offered this on an on a open basis. So mm -hmm. a very high percentage, uh, more than 60%, uh, close to 70% uh, are our students. And the balance are through uh, some of the programs that we have initiated uh, as part of the uh, uh, ministry engagement, especially with the Ministry of Higher Education. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's mix, mix group. It's a mixed group. Yeah. So uh, certain programs are dedicated for uh, some of the uh, Ministry of Higher Education uh, upskilling program. And uh, uh, the higher percentage is obviously uh, open for our students. Uh, the, the awareness was sent out uh, uh, when we broadcasted this as an opportunity. So we have it on our website. Uh, currently, even uh, if you go to our website, uh, as I'm looking at it right now, we offer actually about uh, six uh, micro-credentials, which are uh, live. They are going to start, our, our have started uh, this month. Uh, and likewise, we always uh, update our website on, on, on the current programs that are being offered. Uh, so likewise, uh, th those are the, the demand, uh, based on demand and the programs that we offer uh, in real time. That means what's happening month to month. Uh, but as, as an awareness, uh, what we have learned uh, from the, uh, from the uh, 
2021 rollout when all the 785 that taken and, and finished it. Uh, the question is at this moment in time, see, we started in 2019, why, where micro credentials was something that you could take uh, online, you could uh, do it uh, at the ease of your time. Uh, there was uh, a lot of pondering and, and strategic views on a synchronous and synchronous mode of delivery. Uh, but at this moment in time, uh, a lot of the uh, younger generation, they, they have a lot of uh, uh, things that go through your mind in terms of uh, micro-credentials actually worth it uh, because classes are online, a lot of the communications are online, and again, micro-credentials are online. So when it was first started, it was online, while a lot of the other things that ran in their, in their normal uh, education uh, uh, lifestyle was face-to-face. Uh, so that was one question that that has uh, ar that has uh, arise now uh, based on too much of everything being online, but we managed to somehow uh, go through this phase and uh, educate them, show them the benefits, show them the outcomes, and how they can profile themselves. So I keep on using the word profiling of themselves. Uh, the second uh, pondering or the second question that always pops up is: Is this accredited? is the program that we are offering accredited. So we don't need accreditation for uh, our program uh, in terms of micro-credentials because they are offered by the university. Uh, if it's going into a stackable mode that leads to a, a, a semester of completion or a year of completion, yes, we need it to be accredited. But at this current point, we don't have to have it accredited. Uh, the other, the other thing that came about uh, from the awareness is also from the point of uh, what is micro-credential or how can it be different from any other video that they can watch on any other platform? Uh, because there are a lot of videos and a lot of learning uh, uh, gateways that are offered by even the industry uh, uh, bigger players, uh, especially the, uh, the companies uh, uh, that are uh, uh, I would call them the, the greater software houses that also have a lot of tech uh, upskilling uh, on their platform. Uh, and how is the ones that we are offering different to theirs? So those were some of the uh, awareness uh, that we have to address and concerns that we had to address uh, as part of the rollout. Because we have to make sure that uh, the people or the students that take our micro-credentials understand uh, what is micro-credentials, the benefit of it, and how are we going to deliver it? Uh, and that was very important for us. So that was part of the awareness process and some of the challenges that we faced. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Vinish. And um, I guess I'll go quickly into the next one. Um, um, because I think one of the questions that you brought up, Dr. Vinish, was on um, the questions that um, ought, uh, uh, potential learners have um, in terms of other programs accredited. So um, I think this ties with um, in terms of the rec recognition and confidence of micro credentials. So I'd like to pose the next question to Dr. Eddie. Um, coming from the uh, background of an accreditation agency, so Dr. Eddie, as with any programs, lifelong learning programs like micro-credentials, um, do you think these type of programs need to be coordinated, quality assured, and accepted by the industry for it to be successful? And um, if yes, how do you see this effort taking place with regards to um, the current micro-credentials that are already being offered? Thank you. Thank you, Mashita, for this very important question. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, um, if, if I may just share a bit on um, many of us who were actually involved in the development of the GGP for Macro Credentials for MQA uh, some time ago, mm -hmm. uh, realized that um, up at least up to 2019, Macro Credentials used to be an unregulated space. Uh, in other words, there was no external quality assurance processes governing micro-credentials. And I'm not just speaking um, in terms of um, our, our condition here in Malaysia, but worldwide, uh, in mm -hmm. different parts of the world. Um, there were so many micro-credentials providers and brands in the market. Right? Uh, we, we see them everywhere. We, we can easily identify a long list of uh, providers. Um, 
And when we look into the perspective of employers and learners, mm -hmm. uh, we, we realize that the employers on one hand, uh, they, they needed help to understand what is micro-credentials. And, and that will help them to judge the value of micro-credentials, which uh, unfortunately, up to 2019, uh, there were very little um, information or efforts toward um, meeting that requirements of our employers. Our learners, on the other hand, right, they wanted clearer way to curate and express the learning outcomes. They want to be able to tell everyone, uh, including their employers, uh, their colleagues, uh, what have they learned from a micro-credentials course. And, and of course, equally important to learners um, is the fact that they wanted their micro-credentials to be recognized. Mm. And of course, um, if we were to look into the national system, without a national system of recognizing micro-credentials as such, it will be very difficult uh, for the providers to, to have um, a good direction of how micro-credentials can be designed, developed, and, and offered. And, and uh, how would it lead to credit accumulation and transfer, right? And, and um, at that time, many of us formed that conclusion, many of us in the panel uh, who developed the GGP came up with the conclusion that there was no framework, yet we need a framework. And the framework will be very important to guide us in understanding and integrating micro-credentials into formal learning. So because of that, um, as you have rightfully mentioned at the beginning of this session, MQA came up with the GGP last year. Uh, actually, it, it took us, if I remember correctly, it took us uh, two different um, stages to come up with the guideline. As, as, we, um, as we look at the literature available, we look at the practices available uh, in different parts of the world, and therefore um, the panel was guided by uh, a policy. And with that policy, uh, the panel went into detail looking at how micro-credentials can best be implemented. And, um, in, and that greatly benefits uh, us in FAA because it has helped us uh, to develop one very useful guide for the different stakeholders in the industry, uh, including the uh, professional training providers and even universities uh, whose programs that we have accredited. And that will help us to look into the possibility of uh, bridging the academia and industry, but at the same time, um, following what we see uh, in the GGP. Thank you, Mashita. Thank you, Dr. Andy. Thank you so much um, for all of the sharings by um, the panel today. I think we've discussed a few challenges uh, where the micro credentials are concerned, and mm. uh, mainly on awareness, recognition, and confidence of this type of credential. So all of the points brought up by the panels today are really insightful and I believe will be useful information for education providers who are looking to develop or to start their micro-credential journey. And um, I also believe that there are a lot of initiatives that we could run together um, to reduce the impact of these issues because there are a lot of opportunities that micro-credentials can bring forward. And... Um, I think this brings me to the next um, uh, topic that I would like to um, uh, gauge further on um, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, micro-credentials, like in your opinion, um, are industry-relevant, demand-driven and stackable micro-credentials the answer for people to stay relevant, to increase their productivity and be more adaptable? So um, maybe Raj, would you like to start first in terms of um, your, your view on this? Thanks, Mashita. Again, <laughs> one of the most important questions, how do we link uh, industry-based uh, recognition uh, together with micro-credentials? Because uh, we, we believe in HRD Corp, when we first uh, took up the challenge of how do we actually recognize informal learning uh, provided by institutions, uh, training providers, and link this informal learning towards a more uh, recognized pathway. And uh, the end of this entire journey will focus on where does this recognition manage to obtain the status of professional recognition to the learners 
by actually mapping their learning towards the Malaysian qualification framework. So this is very important. And, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, in this uh, rapidly evolving uh, higher education landscape, uh, and, and there is a lot of opportunity for higher education provider and a relevant uh, institution to consider how it should offer its education and training to its uh, intended stakeholders. Uh, in a time where knowledge and skills need to be updated constantly, a three or four year degree uh, may not be suitable anymore uh, to a certain part of the uh, people who are currently busy engaging in so many things. And that's where uh, it is required uh, for a student's employability and entrepreneurship ability to be contemporarily be flexible. However, this recognition should become in a way that it is uh, translatable across academia as well as the work providers. And uh, in a similar note, uh, if we are looking at the workers, the working adults in Malaysia, uh, I would give a very easy understanding term. For example, we, we have millions of blue collars workers in Malaysia, but they have been remaining in their same position, same level for years and they won't be able to climb the ladder as, as, as all the current generation, which is completing the four years program degree, straight away they become an executive. But a person who has been working in the same field for 15, 20 years, they find it very difficult for them to move up the ladder to different level. Why? Because they are stuck within their confined space where they won't be able to move up because they don't have a professional recognition, a paper called degree. So this is where micro-credentialing comes into picture. And as far as HRD Corp is concerned, we, we are trying to accommodate the industry needs with the micro-credentialing of the programs by ensuring that the programs are relevant, the programs are industry-driven, as well as the program meets the stakeholders' needs to cater into their current jobs. This is where the up, uh, upskilling and reskilling of workers takes place immediately as micro-credentials would enable this entire initiative to move seamlessly, all right? Because uh, when, when we talk about micro-credential, end of the day, it's a very direct equation. It gives flexibility to the learners. So this is one of the way that uh, we intend to make as one of our priority area in line with the uh, 12 Malaysia plan, uh, because it has been clearly illustrated in 12 Malaysia plan uh, under the economic empowerment of the nation that micro-credential is the way forward for the development of human capital development in Malaysia. Thank you, Mashita. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, very happy to hear that in the 12 Malaysia plan, micro-credential is being looked at as the way forward. Uh, Dr. Eddie, from your side, um, Earlier, you may also mentioned about the opportunities for financial services uh, professionals in the financial services industry to obtain CPD and formal qualifications via micro credential. Um, so, is there anything else you'd like to add uh, based on what um, Raj have just um, shared earlier? Yeah. Um. Thank you. Thank you, Mashita. Um. Um. I'm I'm in concurrence with Raj. Um. But um. Just a few more points to add. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is very interesting as, um, as we develop the, the GGP, we realize that uh, the idea of unbundling degree is not new. There was an article written about unbundling degrees uh, about 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mind me, 50, 50, 50 years ago about bundling, uh, unbundling degrees. And, and that was when the notion started. And if we were to look into the professional training and development space, I'm sure we will realize that many of us have been attending CPD programs for years. Uh, in the financial services industry, for example, there are certain sectors which, uh, which require the practitioners to undergo regular CPD programs. So for instance, our insurance agents, Right? Um, those who are involved uh, either in, in general or life or family insurance, they need to accumulate some CPD points for them to continue practicing. Similarly, for some of our friends in the capital market sector, 
um, they, they also require uh, some sort of learning for them uh, to um, continuously renew the, their license to practice. But the, the, the question now is that, that the industry has always been asking us as we explain to them the features of micro credentials. So now how different is it going to be compared to the CPD programs that we are doing? What are the differences? What are the similarities as what uh, Prof. Vinish mentioned earlier? Now, how, how, can we, um, how can we give them an appealing uh, state of explanation to, to, to say, you know, why is micro-credentials so different from what we have been doing? You know, and, and of course, I, I'm in agreement too that um, micro-credentials will be the way forward uh, for our workforce to stay productive, relevant, adaptable, and so on. Uh, it is just that uh, we need to bring the awareness to a different level uh, so that they will be able to see uh, the different side of micro-credentials. But interesting enough, Mashita, um, mm. what we realize from the industry is that many of our friends in the industry may not have a good idea about what micro-credentials is all about, but they know about digital badges. I think that, that is interesting. That is something very, very interesting something that many of them have been telling us that, well, if there's, there's such a thing called digital batch, and if it is uh, technologically enabled, you know, there's blockchain, there's system here and there, which we don't really care. But if, but if we can be proud to tell the whole world that I earned this batch myself and I can authenticate it, I can verify it, uh, and I can put the badges on my social media, on LinkedIn, on, on um, Facebook, on different platforms uh, for people to know what I have earned. And more importantly, if I need, um, I need a change in an environment in, in my job and I can showcase, I can tell people those badges that I have uh, instead of carrying with me stacks of certificates of attendance, of, of mm. achievement, I'll be more than happy to do that. So uh, that has actually bring us to a different dimension, bring us to a different perspective of how uh, people look at micro-credentials and at what point can we define micro-credentials that can be very different from the CPD program and other programs that we have been seeing in the market. Thank you, Mashita. Thank you, Dr. Eddie. Uh, very insightful information. Um, and also, I think, uh, based on what you have mentioned, if um, um, the the potential students are already aware of, or potential learners are already aware of um, the digital badges, um, but not so much on um, micro credentials. So, uh, would you say that probably the next thing is to, um, in terms of on the, is on the owners of course providers to come up with stackable micro credential so that um, learners will be able to. Um, uh, take out these courses and stack them towards a formal qualification. So um, it would be um, in terms of the work that we have to do as the uh, course providers would be making sure that these stackable, um, these stackable uh, courses are also the courses that would be um, uh, the demand-driven uh, courses so that uh, it will be more attractive to uh, a lot of the learners out there and, um, and making sure that even though they are industry relevant and demand driven, it is also, um, um, it is also, it's also part of a formal qualification uh, from a higher learning institution. Mm -hmm. So, um, um, Moving forward with the, the discussion today, so I think um, Dr. Vinish, earlier, um, you have also shared from your experience uh, on the strategies that you have implemented in shaping and producing micro-credentials at EPU. Um, do you have any advice or tips um, for education for providers who are looking to start developing their own micro-credentials? Would you like to share more from um, uh, from the previous sharing, are there any uh, any more um, advice or tips that you'd like to share? Yeah, I think there is a, uh, rather than just uh, put everything as if it's a, a buffet line on a, on a 
on a very good iftar uh, session, but actually you have to study the market demand. You know, uh, there is a market demand very specific to certain skills requirement for for the workforce, and everything is happening now in a, in in a manner that you may come out with this kind of qualification, but you may actually go into a different kind of uh, work uh, characteristics or work uh, uh, requirements. Uh, and those uh, requirements, skills, knowledge may not necessarily be in your qualification uh, journey. So it is very important that uh, the upskilling process is based on market demand. And that is the study that we did. Uh, we actually studied, uh, we didn't want to do a buffet. Uh, uh, it, it is senseless to do a buffet because then you could you could offer one micro-credential and you only have one student inside. We wanted to ensure that there was a market demand. And I think we worked very well with our corporate, uh, corporate training uh, division, our department within APU, who run uh, trainings uh, for the public and also for our students uh, based on professional certification. Um, and they've been doing this for, for more than a decade now. So we worked with them, studied the public demand, and then we surveyed the internal demand uh, for students. And uh, micro-credentials uh, uh, that we offered does not have a prerequisite, which means that it is open to any age, um, anyone uh, from the public or students that can uh, who want to take it. And, and that is the important factor. I think the important factor is market demand. So once you know the market demand, uh, the next thing is know, to know is the industry benchmarking in terms of uh, content. Uh, because the content is uh, concise, it is uh, compressed into a short period. So what they really need to know in terms of skills and knowledge so that they can use that and utilize that in terms of their profiling uh, uh, when they speak about it or when they actually use it uh, in, when they start working or well, even if they're already working in, in, in a certain uh, field or discipline. Uh, so those are the two areas that was very important to us. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, and also, I think just to uh, cover this particular uh, uh, topic, right, in terms of market demand, um, Raj, from your point of view, are there any other angles that course providers can start thinking about in order for them to produce highly impactful micro-credentials or highly demand uh, micro-credentials? All right. Uh, in line with the, what the uh, prof has quoted earlier, uh, when we talk about the essential for micro-credential, uh, the, the only uh, vision is to actually enable Malaysians to continuously reskill and upskill themselves. And uh, however, in, in, in coming up with this uh, effective mechanism, we want to ensure that uh, our training providers, regardless whether they are higher education providers, accredited centers, or any providers, they should actually improvise uh, the effectiveness of programs uh, to meet uh, the learning needs by uh, increasing the use of uh, industry-based training programs streamlining the community-based programs and also uh, introduce uh, entrepreneurship training in high value economic sector. And uh, on the other skill set uh, that, that we are actually looking is uh, in terms of improving the regulatory and uh, funding support to broaden access through the enhancement of uh, existing frameworks for recognizing prior learning and also to expand how uh, the, the institution stakeholders can come forward to support the new sectors and target group. Uh, in terms of the skill areas and so on, uh, as far as uh, HRD Corp uh, is concerned, our micro-credential uh, framework is built upon on uh, 25 uh, skill areas, which, which uh, represent most of the uh, established skills, future skills required, uh, in line with the uh, RNK-12 to support uh, the human capital development of the nation. So uh, it, it, it again uh, depends on the respective providers in terms of uh, the skills that they want to venture in and uh, consider because uh, like rightly pointed out by Prof earlier, it's demand driven. And uh, we are still in the phase of uh, creating more awareness and creating the need for the stakeholders to take up micro-credential. 
So uh, the skill areas should be focused based on the demand. However, we should not uh, neglect the requirement of future skills because this is where how we shape the entire landscape of human capital development and uh, future skill area needs to be given a due consideration uh, and it should be in line with our nation's uh, uh, 12 Malaysia plan uh, inclusion and so on. Thanks, Manchita. Thank you, Raj. Thank you so much. And I look forward to the framework that HRD Corp is developing to also look at the 25 skill areas. Um, I think it will be really useful for a lot of cost providers as well. Um, Dr. Eddie, so uh, uh, following up on one of the, from one of the points that you have mentioned earlier about bridging the um, gap between academia and industry. Um, coming from the point of view of an accreditation agency for the finance professional, have FAA been approached or have a FAA approached any higher learning institutions to collaborate in coming up with courses that incorporate on the job training and professional certifications? Thank you. Thank you for this, um, again, yet very important uh, question, Mashita. Uh, as, as I've mentioned earlier, as you have rightfully recalled, uh, we have been going all the way out, talking to universities and professional training providers, uh, and to share with them the idea of uh, jointly offering um, their courses or programs, and then park that under this notion or the umbrella of micro-credentials. Um, it is, uh, I, I must say that at this stage, um, it is still at a very infancy stage. Um, people are still exploring the idea of how can they work together? Why uh, must they work together? How can they work together and so on? So uh, this is still a, a, a fairly new idea to explore. And of course, having said so, if we were to, to, to take away the, the two words micro-credentials, uh, we are already seeing some uh, universities and professional training providers uh, offering joint certifications for their students or graduates. So this is already happening. Uh, what is probably not, what is still new is to look into the possibility of how can they uh, be sort of um, be categorized under micro-credentials. So this is something that we are still working with. Uh, there are of course obstacles, I must say that there are, of course, of course, obstacles, but we believe that uh, if we uh, can um, come up with a good value proposition and if we can go beyond awareness, as what uh, Prof. Binish uh, put it, as well as uh, Mr. Raj, if we can go beyond that uh, to go into ID uh, or even higher stages, that's where I think we will all realize that the values brought about by such partnership uh, could outweigh the challenges that we uh, are facing to establish a brand for ourselves. And, and I believe that is more important. That is something that uh, we have been telling uh, our different stakeholders in the market. Thank you, Mashita. Thank you so much, Dr. Eddie. Um, so I'm also mindful of the time, but I think we do have time to take one, one question. Uh, we have two questions, but um, questions from Prof. Akta, I think, is already discussed in terms of um, areas of need by industry. Um, there is another question. I think uh, maybe uh, I, I would like to get uh, the Binish view on this. Um, are the entry requirements of attending and macro credential credit bearing of the MQA full accredited program? to meet before a student registered for micro-credential credit bearing. Um, I think uh, it, this is related to uh, uh, recognition of prior learning because some students do not meet a program entry requirement um, but would like to take a micro-credential credit bearing micro-credential and register as a student for the program. So um, do you have any views on this at the minute? Uh, yeah. So the other uh, uh, design model is to create uh, uh, the micro-credentials based on uh, a type of uh, uh, prerequisite entry uh, uh, model. So, which means that they're coming in, but for example, they, do, they have not taken uh, a certain subject, which is uh, part of the entry requirement. Mm -hmm. Then 
uh, we could actually offer it as a micro credential uh, and and be part of the stacking towards the uh, uh, entry requirements. Uh, that has been in a lot of discussion uh, within uh, APU as well, uh, whereby we could offer uh, the micro credentials uh, as a as a as a entry requirement uh, stepping stone, uh, so that they are seamless into the degree program. Uh, a very good example is, for example, uh, you don't take additional mathematics. Um, I'm just giving a classic example: Ad additional mathematics uh, for your SPM, uh, and then you want to come into the computer science program and you don't have it. So then uh, you could actually uh, design uh, the additional mathematics program uh, and get the NQA uh, approval uh, for it to be a, a sort of a, a, a micro credential that allows them to come into the computer science program. That's a, a classic example. But uh, there are a lot of micro credentials that now we are doing as part of the bridging exercise uh, for our postgraduate students. Mm -hmm. Postgraduate students are better uh, because uh, they, they come from a certain discipline, but they are going into a different uh, discipline study at postgraduate level. So when they take these bridging courses in the form of micro credentials, uh, they can actually uh, speed up uh, their entry. Uh, and then their learning process uh, will be less challenging. And I think that's important. Thank you, Dr. Vinish. I think that's a really good uh, use case that you have um, shared with us. Uh, I think under the OpenCRATS framework, we do have a type of micro-credential that we call as a pathway micro-credential where um, it can provide uh, the learners uh, a pathway towards uh, getting uh, towards registering for uh, a program or also it could be a pathway towards um, getting an interview or getting an internship so I think that is a, a good use case that you have shared as well as a potential pathway micro potential um, okay I think uh, it's already 10 45 and um, with that I'd like to thank you all of the panels today thank you so much Dr. Andy and also Raj for your valuable insights and sharing your experience with us. It was really a pleasure discussing all of these points with all of you today. And um, if there are opportunities in the future, I think we'll be more than happy to organize uh, other similar sessions for us to gather again and learn more from uh, all of you. And um, I hope the points that we have covered today has been beneficial for the audience. And um, if we could get your feedback, I think there was a poll earlier that was uh, um, that was shared by the team. So um, based on the feedback that you have provided to us, uh, it, it will really help us in organizing more sessions like this. And um, you can also let us know if you'd like to get uh, if you'd like us to get in touch to just chat about your micro credential initiative or anything that's related to uh, education technology. So at the beginning of this session, I've also shared about the Open Learning's journey and about the OpenCRAS framework. If you are interested to learn more about OpenCRAS, you can visit our website or also you can also contact our team to book a demo or learn more about Open Learning as well. Um, the links will be shared by my colleague in the chat box. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so thank you so much for staying with us um, till the end of the session. Um, I think the next session will be starting soon. So um, take a break, grab your coffee or grab your refills and join us in the next session. Have a good day. Thank you so much to all the panels. Thank you, Mashita. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mashita. Thank you.